Hello, Captain VFC here with another build analysis video. This time the 172nd de Havilland Vampire T11 stroke J28C from Airfix. If you are new here, this is not one of those build videos where I talk you through every single part being glued to every single part. It's more of a general analysis of the experience, highlighting some of those parts that I feel need extra descriptions. There will also be a little history of the Swedish Vampires, the J28C, in here as well. Well, a very brief history because um, this is not a long video. This was quite an easy kit to build. Anyway, already briefly touched on it, so I will highlight it now. As you've probably seen from the thumbnail, I did not do this as the colourful RAF T11. I instead chose the Swedish J28C. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is a shout out to Fenris Models. I was inspired to make my kit, which I already had in the stash, based on their build video, and they did the RAF one and did a fantastic job at it. So I will put the, a link below, and there should be a card appearing now if I've timed it properly. Um, and I wanted to do something a little different rather than just replicating the same one. And also I recently made a Mr. Craft Hawker Hunter, which for ease of sanity I also did in Swedish colours and therefore I thought, well, I'll paint them both at the same time. It is also something a little different. You know, you see these aircraft all over the place, usually in camouflage or in silver, um, uh, trainer silver, and I just felt like something a little bit different. So here we go, my first Swedish aircraft. Yes, this video is after the Hunter, however, um, this was actually finished a tiny bit sooner, maybe? I can't remember. Anyway, on to the construction, and this mostly follows the order of the instructions, with a key difference being the fact that this is a tricycle uh, undercarriage aircraft, that is, for those who don't know, it sits on its nose as opposed to having a wheel on its tail. And when I make tricycle undercarriage aircraft, I get very paranoid about weight. And of course, as you can see, this has a very distinctive twin boom design, which adds quite a lot of weight to the rear. So in typical captain fashion, I decided to make it more in a more modular way. So making those boom assemblies first, and then I can get a better reference point as to how much weight I think it's going to need. Spoilers, didn't quite turn out as I expected for the right sort of reason. Uh, the kit has fairly basic interior detail, a couple of seats, uh, some rivet detail, uh, instrument panel, you know, the usual sort of stuff. Very nicely done, but still rather rather simple. It's not overly complicated. Uh, honestly, the fact that it's painted black means it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I did branch off the instructions here by painting the seats, the ejector seat fabric in a mixed green-ish colour, just mixing some green, some brown, something like that. The instructions say to paint it black. I don't think that is correct. I have no reason to believe the fabric would have been black on this sort of aircraft. The green makes it much more visually interesting. Uh, sorry, I forgot how to speak there and I uh, can't be bothered to edit that out. Um, but it also means I think it's more correct to be green and it brings it in line with other models that I've made of this period, uh, planes of this period. The interior has just one decal, which is the instrument panel. These are cartograph decals, there, there is no problem with them, it just goes on nicely. Uh, basically everything is painted black, except for the seat fabric, which is green, and the control columns, which are silver and black. Two pilot figures are included with this kit, although I suppose more accurately one would be a pilot and a training pilot. Uh, however, I did not fit them. I tend not to fit pilots. It, it, I do still think that it is important that they are included. I like having that choice, but in my own opinion, I, I display my aircraft sitting on the ground. Therefore, I would rather not waste time painting pilots. I don't think I'm very good at it. I have done it before, as you can see from some other kits, uh, some other videos, but hey, not this time. Anyway, the fuselage was tested. That is right, this is me testing the fuselage, not gluing it together. Uh, I'd always stick the interior piece to one side first and then test, make sure everything is set, then remove the clamps or elastic bands or tape and then go back from there. As already mentioned, this is of course a nose sitting aircraft and I put weight in that large bulbous nose piece in front of the cockpit. This was just sheets of lead, I say sheets of lead, it's a sheet of lead and I cut it into miscellaneous rectangle shapes and just trial fitted, making sure it roughly felt about right. 
before gluing the fuselage together. I know I said I made this in a modular way and I did. However, the way that this kit is designed means it is not really feasible to actually test whether it's going to sit on its nose or drop to its ass without just going for it and gluing. The instructions tell you to put seven grams in, but my scales are not very precise. So I don't know exactly what constitutes seven grams so I just filled the entire nose with lead. A very quick safety notice, as I'm sure somebody may mention it in the comments. Um, lead can be poisonous, it can be toxic. Please do not lick it or insert it anywhere that it should not be inserted. Thank you. There is engine detail that is visible from the intakes. Uh, in fact, it looks bloody lovely, except of course you can't see it. But there are these three parts, which it's the in intake on either side going to the engine piece in the middle. And it looks lovely when it's on the sprue, it looks nice when it's painted, and then you glue it into the aircraft and there is no way of seeing it. But I'd rather it be there and not be seen than not be there and there just be nothing inside. So overall, quite good. And then from there, the rest of the aircraft basically just falls together with the top wing and then the booms and then the bottom wing securing the booms. There is one thing that I did here which I would change. The instructions tell you to put the undercarriage legs on before the bottom of the wing goes on and I thoroughly advise that you do that. I did not want to do it because I didn't want to break the legs off and I weighed up the idea and thought, actually, this will be fine. Turns out it isn't fine. I had to then modify the legs slightly to actually get them in the bloody holes. But, hey, we live and we learn. Not the end of the world, and it still sits and it still looks fine. But putting the bottom wing pieces on here is not really ideal. Being a fairly simple kit to build, we are already nearing the end of construction and moving towards painting, so I will just quickly drop to a little bit of history. The de Havilland Vampire was the second British jet-powered aircraft. It was eventually... It was essentially de Havilland trying to fit a single jet engine into an aircraft rather than relying on two, such as the Meteor, which was its predecessor, which is why it has this unique twin boom design to keep that jet thrust out of the way of any essential control surfaces. It was incredibly successful for a very short amount of time as technology barreled forwards, making it obsolete in frontline service very soon after its introduction. But of course, the type lived on as a trainer. And in fact, Sweden, one of the many international buyers, after withdrawing them from fighter service, like many other nations, did keep the trainers on, with the last trainer being withdrawn as late as 1968. These aircraft are common in the skies to this day, with the example included in the kit being one operated by the Swedish Air Force Historic Flight, which I think is as it should be for such a distinctive and successful and wonderful looking aircraft from the best British aircraft manufacturer that there was, Fight Me. Anyway, moving on to the painting, you can see that I've, I primed the aircraft in black, and then exactly the same as I did with the Hunter, because these were painted at the same time, I sprayed some Vallejo Model Air 71049C grey on the bottom, and then uh, what I felt to be an appropriate drab on top, which was RLM 83 from Hataka, thinned with Hataka thinner. Now, this whopping great decal sheet, as you see there, don't really need any of it, we're just using this uh, small strip at the bottom, which means I now have a lot of spare high-vis day-glow decals, but hey, never mind. And as cartograph decals, they are very good, they're easy to put on, they're not too thick, they're not too thin, they generally speaking work absolutely fine. I did have a problem with a couple of them which we will get to very shortly, but that is for a very specific reason. This is, of course, a much more stripped back version of the Vampire than the first option, with really just a couple of roundels and some basic markings on it. Although, as it depicts the aircraft in its current form, it also has the modern registration, which is underneath the tail wing on both sides. That is important, because the instructions don't show that. Let me show you. Not the first time I've seen instructions do this, but it shows part 95, part decal 95, which is SE-DXU. It's the registration on the starboard side of the aircraft. But flip over to the port side of the aircraft, and again, 95, but it's missing. It's just not there. Now, is this an issue? Well, not really. Um, it's obvious where it's supposed to be, but this is a common theme that I have found with Airfix uh, decal instructions, where there'll just be a number pointing to something that just isn't there on one half of the aircraft. Anyway, the only one that I had problems with, I alluded to it earlier, it was actually the day glow. Although saying that, I'm 
completely unable to work out which way round this warning patch goes and it took a, a several attempts and several revolutions with the stick to actually work it out. Day glow is an awkward colour to get right and the decals are very thick for it so even though there are only two small ones on the top of the aircraft and two on the bottom of the aircraft they required an awful lot of decal solution and an awful lot of shouting and at one point one of them completely fell off and I found it on my knee a couple of hours later. I had to return to reapply it a couple of times afterwards. Some Vallejo matte varnish was then applied liberally and then the canopy was in installed and painted however you can see that there was <gasps> some silvering over those warning panels uh, I did gloss it beforehand and I thought I was being careful but clearly well it just happens sometimes it just ha it's not the end of the world it's just a bit annoying that I get this far and I do all the things to try and make the kit look as good as possible and of course you end up with some buggers silvering but hey ho never mind uh, also, that was Tamiya silver being used on the on on the everything actually on the uh, wheel wells, the undercarriage legs, uh, the wheel hubs. There are some counterbalances that go underneath the the, the tail wing. Is it, well, it's, it's a wing, isn't it? It's a horizontal surface, but it's in the middle. I don't know if there's a name for it, but the the rear horizontal surface. So they were then applied. The reason why I didn't apply them as per the instructions before doing all of this is I am clumsy and will knock things off. So I like leaving a lot of this stuff right till the end. And that goes for the undercarriage as well, which just sat nicely inside. And here we have it, the finished product. Let me know what you think. Before anyone comments on it, I did not add panel liner and I did not add any weathering. Firstly, I don't know how to weather a jet. It's just, it's counterintuitive. Secondly, I like my things to look smart. And thirdly, these panel lines are quite thick already. And I feel that if you just drop a load of panel liner in it, they'll look like they're completely detached from the rest of the aircraft. And I don't like that. I much prefer having a more subtle look than going for heavy panel liner. But yes, here it is, slowly revolving. I think, uh, I think it looks really good. Um, very different in the Swedish colour. Like I say, uh, this is only the first, well, sorry, second Swedish aircraft that I have done. And I would absolutely do it again. I thoroughly recommend this kit. I probably will get another one. Certainly if I see one discounted, I will. It did not need this much weight. There is no chance this is ever going to sit on its tail. It is ridiculously heavy. But hey, I'd rather it be too heavy than a tail sitter. I think that just about covers it, so I shall go, but before I do, uh, just a quick shout out, uh, just, uh, just a quick shout out, can't even speak, it's the end of the video and I've been rambling for so long I've forgotten how to English. Quick shout out to my channel members, please join them if you can, but don't worry if not, liking the video would be great, notification bell, subscribing would be really helpful, just the usual stuff to just please the algorithm and this kit was actually made partly on my twitch channel so if you want to see me build them live that is where i do it um i don't have a schedule i just sometimes turn up and make kits and sometimes i don't anyway i'll let you get on with your day thank you very much don't forget to check out fenris models if you haven't already and i will see you in another video soon i hope goodbye